In this lecture, we're going to see that the local flaws of two vector fields commute if and only if its Lie bracket is equal to zero. Moreover, we will see a rectification theorem for a family of k vector fields that are independent in a neighborhood of a point and that commute. In other words, such that their Lie brackets are always equal to zero. This theorem is a generalization of the one that we already saw for one vector field that is non-singular in a neighborhood of a point. And finally, we will see that the Lie bracket is covariant. In other words, if we have vector fields that are related by a C infinity map, their Lie brackets are also related. We are going to characterize when the local flaws of two vector fields commute. Okay, so first of all, let us define the commutation of local flaws. Uh, and we have uh, two vector fields, X and Y, C infinity vector fields, consider the local flaws, phi T and psi S of X and Y respectively. We say that these local flaws of X and Y commute if for every C there exists some delta that depends on C such that uh, psi of S and phi of T commute for all S and T uh, of modulus smaller than delta. If this happens for every point, then we say that the local flows commute. And we say that the vector fields commute if the Lie bracket is equal to zero, okay? So we have commutation of flaws and of local flaws and commutation of vector fields. Now we are going to show that these two concepts are equivalent. In other words, the local flaws of X and Y commute if and only if the Lie brackets commute. Okay, what happens is that we have uh, this equality and uh, we can, for instance, uh, fix T uh, small enough, okay? And what happens when we fix T and we consider this, this curve, the curve parameterized by S of this form, this is just a parameterization of a trajectory of the vector field Y, right? But uh, it is also the image by phi t of the curve that has uh, this parameterization, which is uh, another uh, integral curve of the vector field y. So what happens is that uh, phi t is sending trajectories of the vector field y to trajectories of the same vector field. So in particular, phi t it relates y with itself, okay? As a consequence of that, okay, so phi t relates uh, y with itself, and indeed psi s also relates x with itself, okay? But now uh, that's going to imply that, uh, for instance, uh, when we consider uh, the differential of phi t at a point c, and we apply this to y of c, this is going to give us y of phi y phi t c right? And in particular, this implies that yc is going to be the differential at the point phi tc <coughs> of the map phi uh, minus t, which is the inverse of phi t, applied to uh, y at the point phi t of c, right? But this is the expression that appears in the definition of the Lie derivative of y by x. So indeed, the 
the derivative of y by x is indeed the derivative at a point c, of course, it's going to be the derivative of this expression at zero. But this expression is constant, so the derivative is going to be zero. So since this happens for every point, we get that the lead derivative of y by x is indeed identically zero, but this is a Lie bracket. So if the local flaws commute, then the vector fields commute, right? Now we want to prove uh, the other implication that if the vector fields commute, then uh, the local flaws also commute, okay? And we're going to consider, uh, we're going to fix uh, some C, and we are going to consider this map over here. Okay, the differential of phi minus t uh, applied to uh, y of phi sub t of c, right? This is uh, a map that is sending, for instance, a neighborhood of zero in the line to uh, the tangent space of M at the point C, right? It's a, it's a, it's a map between uh, a, a neighborhood of the origin in the line and that tangent space, the tangent space of M at C. But the, uh, what happens is that uh, we know that the derivative of this map at zero is just the lead derivative of y by x at the point c of if we want uh, the Lie bracket which is equal to zero. So the derivative of this map at zero is going to be equal to zero. What we want to see is that this map is constant. So we want to calculate the derivative at other points. Okay, so let's uh, fix uh, d small enough, and let's calculate the derivative at a point t, right? This is going to be the limit when h tends to zero. Let's apply just the definition of, of the derivative. And here we're going to have the differential at the point phi of t plus h applied to c, here phi of minus t uh, minus h, the differential of this map here, okay, and okay. this is just the definition of the derivative. But what we can do is consider here the differential of uh, phi minus t at the point phi t c, okay? Uh, applied to the limit when h tends to zero. And here we are going to consider the differential at the point phi t plus h of c of phi minus h, okay. And here it's uh, minus uh, y at the point phi t of c. Okay, uh, because the composition of these two differentials is this one uh, by the chain rule. Okay, but now uh, what happens is that this is going to be the differential of phi minus t at this particular point applied to this limit. And this limit indeed is uh, by definition, right? It's um, this limit is just the lead derivative of y by x applied to the point phi t of c. 
is exactly that definition. And since the Lie bracket is always equal to zero, this uh, expression is going to be the image of, uh, by the differential of this map at this point of uh, the zero vector, so it's going to be zero. And this happens for, for every t small enough. So what we get in this way is that our map that was the differential of this point of phi minus t applied to y of at the point phi sub t of c. This, uh, which is defined for small values of t, this map is constant. And indeed, of course, it's constant equal to its value at zero, but uh, phi sub zero is the identity, the differential of the identity is the identity. So this is just y at the point c, right? And uh, what happens in this way is that uh, uh, now we can realize by considering the composition with the differential phi sub t that we get that the differential of the point c of phi sub t applied to y C is going to be y at the point phi t of c. Okay, and this is going to happen for every c and for t small enough. Okay, but this is uh, actually implying that this flaw is uh, preserving the vector field y. So this implies that uh, uh, phi t all these flaws, when defined, uh, uh, relate y with itself. And so uh, what we get in this way is that um, they send trajectories of y in trajectories of y. But uh, as usual, this implies that we have this commutation, okay? Because if we fix t, this is, and we write s, this is, and we consider here some point, we fix x, we fix t, and we write s, this is the image of a trajectory of y, and if we fix x and t, this is a trajectory of y. So, and these two trajectories are the same because they have the same initial condition, which could be phi dx, okay? So we end up with this equality, the commutation of flaws, and in this way, uh, we uh, have uh, the proof of the theorem, okay? This, this completes the proof of the theorem. Now let us consider our rectification theorem, not just for one vector field, but uh, for a finite number of them for a finite number of commuting vector fields. So consider k uh, C infinity vector fields defined on a manifold M such that uh, their Lie brackets are all equal to zero. Consider a point x0 in which these k vector fields are linearly independent, okay? So then there exists a local chart of M where x0 belongs to, this, uh, to the domain of the local chart such that in the, the coordinates of the local chart, these vector fields become the coordinate vector fields, okay? Uh, so we are going to prove this result for the case k equal to. The proof for the general case is completely analogous, okay? So first of all, this is a local theorem, so we can work in local coordinates and we can suppose uh, we can assume actually that M is Rn and that uh, the point is the origin, right? So in local coordinates, we have that X is the sum of 
aj times uh, partial with respect to xj and y is uh, sum of uh, bj times the partial with respect to xj, okay? And what happens is that uh, if we consider here this uh, matrix in which the lines are uh, the components of our vector fields, and we evaluate at zero, this matrix has rank two because these vector fields are linearly independent at zero. Okay, so one of the minors, one of the two by two minors of this matrix is indeed uh, of determinant uh, of non-vanishing determinant. Let us assume for simplicity that it is the first one. Okay, so this minor is going to have a non-vanishing determinant. Right, and now we are going to consider uh, the following map. It's not going to define in the whole uh, sorry, Rn is going to be defined in a neighborhood of the origin, okay? And uh, we are going to uh, call as usual the flow of x as phi and the flow of y as psi, okay? And um, the, the map sends x1, x2, and so on to uh, the following point. It's, it's going to be a similar formula that the one we have for uh, the rectification of just one vector field, okay? So what happens is we consider uh, x1 equal to x2 equals zero, all the points in this uh, linear subspace of co-dimension two are fixed, okay? And then uh, what we do, if we want to uh, obtain the image of a general point is considering the point here that uh, has coordinate zero, zero, x3, x4, and so on, then we follow uh, the flow of the vector field y at time that is equal to x2, and then we follow the flow of the vector field x at time which is equal to x1, okay? And what happens is that if we checked out the Jacobian matrix of f at the origin, we have that if x1 and x2 are equal to zero, this is just the identity map. So the lines of this uh, Jacobian matrix coincide with the lines of the identity matrix from the third line on. So we're gonna have zero, zero, one, and a bunch of zeros, zero, 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 one, and so on. And the first two lines are uh, indeed, uh, uh, the components of the vector fields X and Y. And obviously it is at zero. If you calculate the determinant of this matrix, it's clearly the determinant of this minor. And that's uh, the reason we want this minor to have a non-vanishing determinant. So because of that, this uh, differential at zero is an isomorphism, and then we can apply the inverse function theorem, right? We have indeed our map F, which is going to be defined now in, uh, in a neighborhood of the origin, okay? It's going to be a diffeomorphism, and as we said, the formula is just this one, okay? Now we want to understand 
how f acts over the coordinate vector fields, at least the two first ones. So uh, if, uh, yes, if we uh, fix all coordinates here and we consider, we just uh, consider the parameterization by the first one, we obtain trajectories of this vector field. But again, if we consider something like this, when we fix all the other coordinates, we are obtaining parameterizations of trajectories of the vector field x. So what happens is that f relates the first coordinate vector field and the vector field x, right? In general, if we have a formula like this, it's not true that f relates the second coordinate vector field on y, because if you uh, just consider this and you fix all the other coordinates, of course, you are parameterizing trajectories of y, uh, sorry, of uh, the second coordinate vector field, right? But uh, if you do this here, this part, of course, parameterizes trajectories, and then you are applying this uh, map over here, and a priori, uh, this map is not going to preserve the trajectories of y. But we are in a particular situation here what, where the two vector fields commute. And in that case, that's true, that uh, the flow of x preserves the trajectories of y. Indeed, we have, because of the commutation of local flaws, that we can write the formula this way. And yeah, now it's true that when we fix all other coordinates and we consider a parameterization like this one, this is parameterizing trajectories of y. So f is going to relate to the second coordinate vector field and y. And that's it. f is a change of coordinates that transforms these two coordinate vector fields into x and y. So the inverse transforms x and y into the two first coordinate vector fields. So let us see that the Lie bracket is covariant. In other words, if we have the infinity map from m to n and uh, Map, uh, sorry, vector fields x and y uh, on M that are F related to x tilde and y tilde vector fields on N, then uh, we have that the Lie bracket of x and y is F related to the Lie bracket of x tilde and y tilde. Okay? So let us uh, recall that if we have H, this that it is a C infinity function defined on n, okay, we have that um, x is related, okay, to x tilde by this f related, if we have that x tilde applied to at h, uh, and then we recompose with f is the same that this composition is if and only if. So we have this for every h c infinity function on n. Okay? That's. Uh, and so we want to see if this condition still holds for Lie brackets. So we can see her here. The Lie bracket of x tilde and y tilde applied to h, and then we precompose with f, right? The first thing that we have to do is applying the definition of the Lie bracket. This is going to be uh, x tilde applied to y tilde of h, right? Minus y tilde applied to x tilde of h and everything composed with f. 
But now we, uh, for instance, here, we can consider this formula just replacing H with this function over here, a result of applying the derivation Y tilde to H. And uh, if we do that, we get that this is going to be eight x applied to y tilde of h. And we have to precompose with that. It's just this formula over here when we are replacing h with this other function. Analogously, uh, since y and y tilde are f related, we have that this is going to be y applied to the composition of f and x tilde applied to h. But now we can use this formula over here, right? And the analogous formula for y and y tilde. And so in this way we get uh, x applied to y applied to f composed with h minus y applied to x applied to f composed with h. And this is the Lie bracket of x and y applied to the function f composed with h. But this is exactly what we wanted to prove because obviously this holds for every C infinity function defined on m. So uh, the Lie brackets are also f-related. Assume that we have a non-singular C infinity vector field, a vector field that has no singular points. Associated to this vector field, there exists a natural partition of our manifold in which the subsets of the partition are just the trajectories of the vector field. And moreover, if we consider a point, there exists a unique trajectory going through this point and the tangent space to the trajectory at the point is going to be the subspace of the tangent space of the ambient manifold at the point generated by the vector field. This, uh, indeed, the vector field defines a vector subbundle of the tangent space of dimension one that is providing the tangent space to these trajectories at all points. Another question is whether this still happens for uh, vector subbundles of higher dimension. Okay, whether we can consider a partition, for instance, if the vector subbundle has dimension k, we can consider a partition of our manifold in immersed submanifolds of dimension k such that the tangent space uh, at any point is going to be uh, the fiber of the vector subbundle. And the general answer is that this is not possible. It's possible for uh, dimension one subbundles, vector subbundles, but it is not possible in general for any dimension. But what we're going to see in our next lecture is that we can characterize exactly what subbundles have this property, the so-called integrable subbundles. And indeed, that's going to be the content, that's going to be what we are going to study in the Frobenius theorem. Thank you for your attention.